Welcome everyone to part two of our special three-part live stream series, The Long Silicon, Power and Censorship in the Digital Era, uh, co-produced by The Real News Network and Project Censored. My name is Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief here at The Real News, and it's so great to have you all with us. Thank you for joining us, and we're looking forward to the discussion. And for those who are watching live on Facebook and YouTube, we just wanted to remind everyone that there is a live chat going on, and we will be answering uh, the questions that you send to us. So please hop in there and let us know what you think. So if you missed our first live stream last week, the one that kicked off this co-produced series with Project Censored in the Real News, we talked about the question of freedom in the digital era. What does it mean to be free uh, in the world we live in today? How have our digital technologies made us more or less free, right? And how, what, what definitions of freedom should we be fighting for in our digital reality? Today, we're gonna really be building off of that conversation and focusing on the question of democracy, the related question of democracy, of course. So from viral police brutality videos shot by citizen journalists to whisper networks and remote organizing during the pandemic, we all know that digital technologies have empowered people around the world to advance their own struggles for justice, accountability, democracy, and dignity. At the same time, from unrelenting lobbying efforts to sophisticated systems of surveillance and censorship, from Facebook going to war with the Australian government, to gig companies basically rewriting labor laws in California, big tech continues to assert its power to set the limits of democracy for the rest of us. So what does democracy even mean in the digital era? Is democracy the best way for us to kind of approach the struggles that we face in the digital era? Does it provide a useful frame for knowing where we should go, what we should be fighting for, and how to know when we are being wronged? And what does the struggle for democracy look like in our technology-filled world? So those are the big topics that we're going to be kind of addressing today, and I could not be more excited uh, to have the brilliant panel that we have today to help us navigate this. And I wanted to go around and ask them to introduce themselves so that they could get to frame how you all get to know them. Um, and I'm so, so honored to have them all here. So why don't we, I guess, go around the circle. Meredith, do you want to get us started? Really happy to be here with you all, some of my favorite people, so thank you for having me. I am Meredith Whitaker. I'm the faculty director at the AI Now Institute at NYU, where I'm the Mindaru Research Professor. And before that, I was a longtime tech worker. I uh, founded Google's Open Research Group, and probably most pertinent for this discussion, I was involved in a lot of labor organizing at Google before I was uh, pushed out uh, by the company happy to be here hell yeah and uh why don't we go around i guess let's go let's go clockwise <laughs> so so robin do you want to introduce yourself yes um i'm ha very happy to be here too i'm robin anderson and i teach uh and have been at fordham university for many years i'm in media studies and i have done research on conflict and media representations of war and um, have segued into media and humanitarianism. I'm currently editing a series with Routledge um, called Media and Humanitarian Action. And we have two books and um, four in the, in the hopper. And um, so I uh, write for FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. I'm kind of also a general media analyst and critic. And I also work with Project Censored. Oh, yeah. And Vina, why don't you give the, the good folks at home a little introduction? Sure. Well, I, I should say that I'm honored to be in this um, quadrant of amazing, amazing people who inspire me and who I've learned so much from. Um, I, you'll, I'm a mother, 
So you will hear screaming in the background, um, although hopefully that will end soon as, as they leave for a baseball game. I, um, I'm a law professor at UC Hastings, where I've been for almost six years now. Prior to that, I and prior to graduate school, I was a lawyer doing um, civil rights and labor rights work with um, low income, primarily Muslim American communities um, in the Bay Area. And pertinent to this discussion, I went from organizing and representing taxi workers to organizing and writing about um, and standing in solidarity with um, uh, digital platform workers, um, Uber, Lyft, Instacart, DoorDash workers um, in the Bay Area and have sort of been involved in organizing against these companies. Well, as uh, anyone watching can see, you know, this is a really special panel and we are really, really excited to dig into the big juicy question that gave this panel its title, right? And just like our last panel on the question of freedom in the digital era, I just wanted to say up top that we are well aware that we're not going to be able to come to a definitive answer on this question, nor should we aim to, right? I mean, in many ways, we want to kind of pick apart the question itself to think about you know what democracy means in different contexts what value it has for us as we try to navigate the wilds of the digital 21st century and also just uh to follow up on something that vina said uh we're, we're incredibly grateful to everyone for making time for this but we also don't want to keep vina from uh you know this important family baseball game so uh later on in the stream Vina will have to depart, and then um, Mickey, our, our uh, partner and director of Project Censored, will be hopping in. Um, Mickey, actually, before we get going, why don't you introduce yourself as well to the good listeners? Thanks so much, Max. It's uh, an honor to be here. Once again, we had a stellar panel last week. Uh, it's available online and linked at the Real News Network. If you missed it, definitely check it out. Um, these are... Um, uh, fantastic panel conversations with brilliant minds, leading experts, uh, people that are very concerned about information, about privacy, about censorship, about rights of free speech and expression. Uh, I'm the director of Project Censored, president of the Media Freedom Foundation. Uh, I'm also a professor of social science, history and journalism in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I host the weekly Project Censored show and we at Project Censored, um, along with our uh, my uh, affiliate, Andy Lee Roth, uh, my great associate director. We do an annual book every year. We work with, with students around the country researching the news that doesn't make the news. Uh, our book comes out, Seven Stories Press. So if you want to learn more about us, you can go to projectcensored.org. And Max, uh, as you know, uh, we've been working with you and my colleague, Nolan Higdon, sort of behind the scenes at this. And we'll get to see Nolan at next week's panel, along with Abby Martin, yourself, and others. But again, it's an honor to be here, and I'm really excited to hear from this week's panelists. Um, they've got an awful lot to say, so why don't we go ahead and jump in, and I'll see everybody a little later. I'll be monitoring the YouTube chat and trying to field questions there, so please feel free to put them in there so that we can bring them into the mix. And with that, again, thanks, everybody, for being here, and back to you, Max. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mickey. Yeah. And to folks watching again, uh, Mickey will be moderating the YouTube chat. So send his, your questions there and we'll be uh, answering them on this panel a little bit later. OK, so let's let's dig in. Right. You know, I think that, you know, a, a, as we all kind of acknowledged uh, in the planning stages of this panel. Right. It's very hard to be optimistic about uh, the digital world today. Right. I mean, the the techno utopian sentiments of the early 21st century have uh, have fallen by the wayside and given way to, you know, a, a kind of cold, hard reality in which we are more surveilled, algorithmically conditioned than ever. Uh, a big tech has so much kind of power over so many areas of our lives, including the institutional, uh, the institutions of democracy itself. So, you know, I wanted to go back around the table and just ask the panel, you know, when you heard the title for this panel, what were some of the first kind of topics or questions that came to mind, like in your own work and in your own daily concerns as a digital citizen in the 21st century, where does the question of democracy even figure for you? And I guess, again, why don't we start with Meredith and we'll go clockwise around the panel. I, you know, I 
tend to sort of shy away from this discourse. Um, and I, you know, my reaction was kind of a classic hedge to be like, what do we mean by democracy? What do we mean by a digital era democracy? For whom do we define what we're, you know, electoralism as democracy? Um, and, you know, and then what do we mean by a digital era, right? Because I think, you know, in my work and my thinking, I often get, you know, I like to get very material about these things, right? We're talking about, you know, computational infrastructures that are networked in ways that, um, you know, allow pervasive surveillance, allow, you know, worker monitoring and control and constitutively kind of accrue power in very centralized forms that may not be visible, you know, at the interface of a device, but are certainly the way, you know, the digital world works. Um, you know, the way that the, the digital world we know is constituted. So I think, you know, I think there are a lot of ways we could sort of slice and dice this. I'm less interested in debates around sort of, you know, Russian ops and misinformation. I'm also, you know, less well versed in those um, than I am in looking at questions of power, um, particularly questions of power within racial capitalism and understanding, you know, how do, how do these forces congeal within you know, within a world that is increasingly mediated by those who have access to develop and deploy forms of, you know, computational network infrastructure, which is my sort of big inclusive term for, you know, everything from AI to, you know, distributed software to et cetera. So I'll, I'll stop there with my, my, what was your reaction answer? Well, and I mean, you know, just a just a kind of quick follow up, right? Like as you said in your intro, you were you were in the belly of the beast <laughs> for a good while, right? I guess small intestines. <laughs> it's small in the small intestine of the big tech beast. I guess could I just ask, like, is democracy as such like is this a big concern for your former colleagues? Is this a is this is this what everyone uh, wakes up in the morning to go serve? I mean, people wake up in the morning because wage work isn't consensual under capitalism, right? They like, you know, ultimately. Um, and I think the term democracy, again, it's kind of a shibboleth. It, it serves many different, you know, uh, many different forces. And it was something that, you know, I saw it rise to prominence as a kind of buzzword um, directly following the Arab Spring when suddenly tech companies and the, you know, U.S. government, you know, the State Department, et cetera, recognize that the ways in which organizers um, who were, you know, organizing in, in Tunisia and, and elsewhere during, you know, the so-called Arab Spring used um, technical infrastructures like Twitter to communicate with each other um, gave them, you know, gave the tech companies the ability to kind of paint these technologies as inherently democratizing and by extension to paint the extension of these tech, these, you know, technical products built by these companies into new markets as a force for liberation. So, you know, there was a, an, an entire kind of discourse that was built around the idea of internet freedom of, you know, conflating you know, being surveilled and having, you know, quote unquote, access to, you know, Google or Facebook or et cetera, with a kind of liber liberatory, you know, liberal politics. Um, and so that, you know, I think, again, this, this term serves, you know, many, many different purposes, and is easily kind of collapsed into some of these, you know, these marketing visions that, um, that ultimately serve, the ends of these companies and of a, a kind of a imperial hegemony. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And Robin, what about you? When you, when you um, kind of heard the big, broad, overly broad kind of uh, title of this, this panel, where did your mind immediately go? Well, I put democracy in the digital era in terms of freedom of expression and freedom of the press and, um, and and our ability to communicate with with each other and um, formulate our ideas and direct our own lives and uh, and shape our own worlds as a consequence. And and I was thinking I, I'd like to bounce off what Andy said last last week, which he said we also should think about freedom to hear that we that's our right to know. And so we can't really be global citizens and democratic citizens 
without information that we need to understand how the world works and what's happening in the world. Um, and increasingly, what is absent from the world and, and from our, our media world digitally and legacy is, is are things that are actively being ignored. And now in the digital world, um, you know, ever since Russiagate, we've had these search algorithms which have taken so much of alternative media and, and all kinds of activists in very important groups. Off, off platforms, they've deplatformed, um, uh, and they've taken advertisements around, uh, for example, global warming uh, off, off of Facebook by a little museum in upstate New York um, that had an ad on before the 2020 elections, and that was removed. So, so it's, our, it's, it's our freedom to hear, our right to know, and, and that's being... Um, that's being challenged at this point. Allison also made a very good point last year, which she, she said that it's also about freedom from something. Um, and if we're talking about globally now, and um, I've been thinking globally lately, on a global level, um, we, we should think of global citizens as really demanding and deserving to be free from exploitation. They should be free from fear. They should be free from retaliation for organizing for a better life. And uh, indigenous environmental defenders should not have to be forced off their land and killed by extractive industries globally. Um, so so these sound a lot like basic freedoms to me, and, in, and indeed they are codified. I like to, in my kind of humanitarian uh, uh, theorizing, um, I like to look at the, Uni the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, and I tend to think in accordance with humanitarian principles on a global level of human dignity. And for example, water. Water should be a human right. We know that people are experiencing um, um, a drought and, and increasingly uh, are, do not have access to potable water of any kinds. And, and, and that seems to me to be the quintessential aspect of loss of freedom. Um, organizations use uh, digital technologies to investigate um, there, there are there are many actually good organizations like Global Witness who are using now uh, digital technologies in the service of uh, investigations and exploring the places in the world where corrupt governments are, are partnering with market forces and capitalist uh, extractive industries to to kind of take out of the, the la out of the globe and out of the earth the last bits of, of the resources remaining. And, um, and they use digital technologies. And for these investigations to, to try to stop uh, the killing of, of environmental defenders and people like that, they've done some very good work. They, have, they often put cell phones into community members' hands and they, 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 they take pictures, they use, they use surveillance uh, and satellite surveillance to actually um, uh, codify and, and, and search for corporations and, and the kinds of things that they're doing in places where journalists can't get to. So, and deliberately so. So there's, there's good uses, I think, um, and important uses of, of digital technologies uh, that bring us information around the globe that we don't find in corporate media and that is very essential to our um, democracy and our ability to be informed as citizens in a democracy. Oh, yeah. And, and Vina, what about you? You know, I uh, my first thought when I saw this question, can democracy exist in the digital era was, well, no. Um, and, and then I had um, a very similar similar response um, to Meredith's response, which is, you know, well, what does democracy mean in this context? Um, who are who are we talking about? Um, if I take the sort of political theory that my um, that my colleagues in the in the law faculty take this idea that that democracy, you know, the idealized notion of democracy in a political context in which democracy is supposed to be in some way um, a political system in which people are all represented um, through through um, through elected representatives, which is sort of the idea that we the ideal in the U.S. in the way that we exist right now. Um, I think. Uh, what I tend to then think about is 
um, is how power is allocated to those representatives. And then I think of how, um, you know, since the 1970s, at least, um, but uh, but even more centrally in the 1970s, laws have shifted to both concentrate um, capital in particular ways that make venture capital possible, that then in turn make these um, these business models possible um, that you know are not even necessarily um, profitable in 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 the tech sphere that spread very fast because of the capabilities of dig digital technologies all over the world, um, and and then how that. Um, how that in turn, um, because of more legal decisions, like for example, Citizens United just 10 years ago, which gave corporations um, free speech rights, um, how, how those uh, sort of work together to concentrate capital and money and power in a way that really makes democracy, however you define it, impossible. Um, and um, and how you know this is not necessarily a story of technology per se or or digital um, a digital era, but really um, a story about capitalism and um, and of advanced capitalism in, in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a really, I mean, all really really brilliant points, and and I think um, for for viewers, we're gonna go back around the table and kind of make this a little more concrete, right? Kind of talk about some examples right now that could maybe help us parse out these questions, right? Like when we talk, when we say democracy, who are we talking about, right? Like who's 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 able to live democratically, and what does that actually mean? Um, how do we kind of distinguish between digital technologies in the abstract? and kind of digital technologies um, retrofitted to a capitalist global system and serves those ends, right? And how does that impact our abilities to live, act, and think democratically? And I guess just to like, um, you know, maybe maybe just kind of be upfront and transparent for, for listeners, when, when we were thinking about kind of the theme of this, I think in many ways, the hope was that we would sort of deconstruct the question itself to show that um, there's not a whole lot that you can tell from the question alone. Um, but I think I try to put myself back at least in that sort of like turn of the 21st century, right? When, when we were still imagining all the amazing ways that the internet and the new technologies that we didn't even, we couldn't even think of yet, right? All the ways that those were going to enhance our basic human abilities to live and act democratically, right? So I think about what that meant to me, right? It meant, as Robin said, that I would have kind of more uh, broad access to information that I didn't have before, right? That I, that, you know, maybe through things like social media, people could have more, the demos in the democracy, the people could have a little more bottom up accountability, um, and hold the, the people in power accountable. Um, we could have better systems through technology to vote um, by consensus. You know, I think that those were kind of the things that we were imagining the internet might allow us to do and the digital technologies that came with it might allow us to do. But I think one thing that, that Meredith said that's really important, right, is that in a way, the ways that we consumers or basic users of digital technology think that we are using kind of technologies for democratic ends, there's always a backside to that, right? They're, the tools that we use are always in turn using us in a lot of ways, right? And so even if we are using these tools to organize during a pandemic, right, to create whisper networks, to hold kind of powerful people uh, accountable for their actions, um, you know, at the same time that we're doing these things, we're being tracked, we're being conditioned, uh, we're possibly even being censored, right? So there's always a sort of feedback loop to the actions that we take in the digital world. And that really shapes kind of whether or not uh, what we think of as democracy is even possible. So why don't we go back around the table? And um, since we know that, um, Vina, you uh, have to leave in a little bit, I guess, why don't we go counterclockwise? And maybe instead of taking the big kind of overly broad question uh, of the the panel, we maybe talk about like specific examples in which the use of digital technologies uh, either enhances or limits 
kind of like the ability of rank and file, you know, workers or um, consumers uh, to to act democratically in their daily lives. Yeah. So there is a um, a relationship, sort of a, an emergent cultural relationship, particularly, I think, in the U.S., but elsewhere as well, um, that equates democracy with consumerism or equates consumerism with democracy since at least um, the least the New Deal era, a, a very, very purposeful sort of approach to both um, both both policy and um, uh, labor policy as well as um, as business policy. And so in the past, I would say 10 years, in the past decade, um, there has been this tendency to understand anything that sort of advances the possibility of consumption as an inevitable and um, exciting way to embrace, embrace uh, a thing that we should embrace for our future. And so, um, you know, the, the instance that I study, um, I, you know, I said I went from studying the taxi economy to the Uber economy um, and you know, there were t certainly different types of tech, you know, we can talk about the taxi economy in itself as sort of a huge technological shift when people started to get cars in the early 1920s, et cetera, and what that did to, um, to what those, pr pr what the production shift did to, um, did to labor experiences and labor organizing experiences. But in this particular moment that we're in, what we saw was um, the, this, this, uh, this world that was once sort of a place of um, of sometimes problematic and sometimes really beautiful um, sort of masculine camaraderie, you know, um, men sitting around at the airport talking to one another, um, uh, complaining about their working conditions, um, having really beautiful relationships and organizing emerge from, from those spaces, um, and then having policies that ultimately were impacted by the organizing that, that occurred through those relationships. Um, you, we saw the proliferation, again, through law, um, uh, fueled by by tech capital, you saw we saw um, the consumption of cheap, fast rides via Uber and Lyft, um, and cheap, fast consumption of of um, books via Amazon, and cheap, fast you know a, a retrieval of groceries and um, and such via via the, these other companies, and um, and all of this consumption on the flip side of the the quickness was a grueling, atomized work, um, and so once you know once where workers were able to have some downtime, like chat with each other, form relationships, organize. Um, now we're in a position, you know, I hear some, some back noises. I don't know if someone needs to put themselves on mute, but um, uh, the, the, um, what, what we have with Uber and Lyft was this environment where there was no place for workers to get to know each other, um, no place for them to organize, no place for them to form relationships, actually like through the the um, the facade of 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 the app itself, all of a sudden people were making um, well below minimum wage, and that became acceptable. That became culturally acceptable acceptable because it was so fancy and so um, and so tech friendly. And um, and then you had Prop Twenty Two pass in California, and what Prop Twenty Two did was ensure that the business model created with all of this venture capital money, the business model of companies that have yet to turn even a profit. Um, cemented permanently into California law, um, ultimately creating a situation in which workers um, have a have no right to the minimum wage, no right to overtime, um, and are really limited in their ability to organize because they are um, they are misclassified as independent contractors, and because the work itself doesn't lend itself to to full time work. Um, people find that they cannot stay in the job because it's so um, so grueling and so low, so low paid. And so the people that do stay in it, the people that work full time, who are most likely to um, create create um, work to create democratic conditions in the workplace, um, the people who are most likely to rebel and to organize, um, th those people don't exist because what you have is people just um, living living hand to mouth and sometimes not even not even hand to mouth, really just like trying to get their hand into their mouth. And, um, and it's fascinating to me in a really 
disgusting, revolting way that this has all happened very quickly in the last eight years um, in the U.S. under our noses and that everyone I know has adopted the cons consumptive practices that enable um, that enable this kind of exploitation and that somehow the the digital nature of it makes it um, makes it okay or makes it seem okay um, or hides um, hides the the conditions that that it creates yeah I mean yeah no, that's really really uh painfully put right i mean like because and i guess just for viewers right you can see how there are a number of different ways of question of the there are number of different answers to the question of democracy converging on what vino was saying right there's democracy in the workplace right workers should have a more democratic say in their working conditions that can't happen uh, under prop 22 because gig companies have essentially you know kind of bypassed democratic governmental kind of uh, operations in order to write out of existence uh, these workers' rights to have that sort of democratic say by classifying them as non-workers. I mean, so so there really is that sort of clash there. And um, I just wanted to emphasize something that I meant to say earlier for, for folks who are viewing. If you have not seen or, or read or checked out uh, Vina, Meredith, or Robin's work, please, please do. I promise you, you're going to learn a whole hell of a lot. Um, and so hopefully this, this live stream serves as a kind of uh, appetizer of all the great work that they've done, which you should definitely check out. So Robin, what about you? I guess, um, what, what sorts of examples are you thinking of real world examples that, that kind of highlight the thorniness and, and maybe the, the uh, unusefulness, right, of this question of democracy when we talk about digital technologies? Well, I like to take it to a global level. I've been thinking globally about democracy and digital technology. And in, in, the, in a global democratization, um, I think we, could, we should think about what, what would that mean? That, that basically the peoples of the world would be the ones benefiting from all of the exploitation of, of global resources. But, but basically they, they should have a right to live in a just and sustainable world. We, we should all, people all around the world should be able to do that. Um, they shouldn't be lived to, to live, they shouldn't be forced to live in terrible, uh, grueling poverty as a tiny few, you know, wallow in great wealth. Um, and so I think of global democracy as basic social justice um, for, you know, all, all working class people and, and basically all people. So if, if, if we think um, in global terms, we have to think um, of fighting uh, for against the global environmental collapse at, at a global level. So much, we do so much in this country, is think of, uh, uh, of the demonstration against the pipelines and think of Bill McKibben and how much he does with uh, 350.org. But if we don't now go on to the Paris Climate Accords and achieve those goals, scientists just told us that the rise in sea level will be unstoppable. So we, we really begin to need to think about uh, global activists and global organizing and the people around the world. And I think that from slow food to alternative energy to over extraction to climate collapse, Really, the, the dialogue, the information, the organizing and the activism has really been done online. It's been done on the within the environmental public sphere that it takes place online. I mean, we we know that we don't hear, we haven't heard, you know, in the decades approaching global collapse that we that the anything about it because of corporate media and the and corp and um, consumer culture and the commodification of everything and and it's and its uh, environmental consequences. So if we take this idea um, of we need social justice uh, globally and we and then we look at Amazon um, and we think about that Amazon is the fourth most valuable company on the globe and that Jeff Bezos uh, has now been labeled the wealthiest man for three years running. Um, we look we look now at Amazon and, and we we have all heard about and, and I'm sure we're terribly disappointed that that the workers failed at Bessemer, Alabama. Um, 
for their bid for unionization. But these things, th th this is an Amazon working revolt around the world in Italy, Germany, uh, and India. And the, these things are very important. And if, if also we think about about working class and, and, and digital technologies, Amazon is supposed to have been based on a digital based on a digital model. And so it's, it's, it's consumer, dig, digital consumerism. Um, and one group that I, that I kind of like is Athena for All, they say, everyone should be able to enjoy the benefits of digital technologies and online commerce without having to sacrifice our rights and liberties. And while that is definitely true because they're collecting our mass and buying our data because Amazon is such a, such a monopoly um, that there's no other choice in town, no other game in town. Um, I think if we start to think about global workers at Amazon and what, what they've been through and how Amazon, even though it's high tech, it's really an old fashioned model of industrial oppression in which now They've got handheld devices that are tracking their every move. Their, their productivity innovations are based on stunning anti-democratic uses of these technologies where they calculate the accuracy and efficiency of their movements and they track where they go. And thus, they pee in bottles instead of taking a break because of this kind of oppressive working conditions. And as one, one, one writer, of course, in, in these times, Louis Leon said that they've really created a reign of terror on the shop floor. If we take Amazon uh, to other countries and not only on the shop floor where people are, are putting things in either trucks, but people all along this incredible interwoven delivery manufacturing system where all of these goods are being shipped uh, and moved around the globe, um, let's take the forever given, the gigantic behemoth ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal to the world's fascination, you know, contemplation, horrors and delights, however you might think of the ever given. Um, but what that, what that big behemoth ship told me and, 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 and made, a, I think, a, quite a few people start to think about all of the goods that are on that ship and how they have to move globally. And part of that is growing the ships bigger and bigger and bigger. And of course, that's economies of scale. And what they're doing is saving money. Jeff Bezos is not the richest man in the world because he doesn't exploit workers at every single level and the environment and all of the people working in all of the nodes from the people who, who stack the containers to the people who, who, who crew the container ships. This is a conversation that's been going on through the International Labor Organization, the International Mar uh, Maritime Organization, the UN Development. Um, this whole shipping industry is terrifically exploitative. And now recently the industry, the shipping industry has said that they were going to cut even further the wages of seafarers, people on the cruise and people who are stacking the ships. So I'm, I'm kind of moving back to what I said in the beginning is our right to hear. We can't really live in a democracy if we don't know what's going on. And the fact that we don't that we, we see the forever given this giant ship in the Suez Canal as kind of a bizarre behemoth mystery, that this is the consequences of, of us getting our goods overnight. And, and, and then to take that into the realm, to think about uh, the material relations that, that it takes and, and, and the exploitation of working people to do that, um, I think will, will, will help us think about the digital world uh, in, a, in a way that it's, that it's being misused, um, but in a way that we can think about also, how that has been used to um, organize laborers for, for, uh, for people in different countries to unite from Italy and Germany to think about uh, only through now global labor unions and, and global um, organizing, are we going to be able to fight a company like Amazon? And um, so, so th that's kind of the way I think of the pros and cons in this example um, of of Amazon and um
what's been going on globally for decades now. Oh yeah. Shout out, shout out to the ever given. Uh, let's get them, let's get them on. <laughs> Meredith, what, what about you? What, um, I suppose, um, in terms of concrete examples, uh, with all the kind of caveats about the central question, what, what's, where's your mind going on with this question? Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry, I may have been the source of the noise being I heard, so I was <laughs> muted. Um, uh, this has given me so much to think about. Thank you both. Um, I think where I'm going to go with this is just, you know, let's start with the ever, get, ever given. Let's start with the comparison to Amazon. Let's recognize that, of course, the U.S., you know, of course, container shipping and these global logistics chains came out of um, empire, came out of military logistics. Um, and so did, of course, um, what we call the internet, right? And I'm going to do a little bit of prehistory here, which I hope, I hope is generative. But, um, you know, I was, you know, if you look back at sort of the, you know, the history of these technologies, where did they come from um, in the U.S. context, which is the context that we're now sort of contending with as a kind of, you know, hegemonic um, digital force in the Western context, you see these sort of networks technologies come out of you know, military environments. And you can look to Lincoln Labs, which, um, you know, found or the Lincoln Project, which was founded in 1951. And this was, you know, right, you know, it's post-war, right? It's as, you know, the, the ascent of the United States empire. Um, we are you know, well into a kind of Cold War mindset at that time. And the Lincoln Project was a, you know, it was a military fantasy of situational omniscience that would allow the U.S. to, you know, using sensors, using sort of forms of, you know, what I would say like proto-artificial intelligence technologies, using networked infrastructures of, you know, different forms of computation would be able to detect a Russian nuclear attack and, you know, stop it, right? So, you know, this this idea has always remained in the land of the fantasy, but it has marshaled significant investment. It has marshaled significant capital. It has built up industries around it. And of course, the ARPANET, which, you know, became kind of the, the internet, um, was born out of Lincoln Labs. You can fast forward to the Reagan era, to the Star Wars program, which was another, you know, fantasy of total omniscience. This time, the idea that we could have, you know, a network of sensors and a network of extremely expensive, you know, computational infrastructure that could shoot missiles out of the sky. Now, you know, an organization of, of, you know, engineers and computer professionals, as they called themselves, computer professionals for social responsibility, kind of marshaled their forces to um, make the point that you know, the claims that were being made about this technology were, um, were you know, not, not possible and, in fact, extremely dangerous. Um, then you get to the 90s and you see, you know, these, these research and military networks that had been built up through this funding that had been, that had you know, kind of grown based on the promises made by these kind of fantasies, right, um, were privatized, right? And you had, you know, you had the NSFnet and, and other networks kind of, you know, turned over to telecoms and other actors, and you see sort of the growth of the commercial internet. And I, you know, I, and, and you see kind of the, the web boom, um, and then, you know, finally you have the rise of, you know, ad tech and the idea that you could sort of, you know, create data about people and then use that data, which you, you know, affirm to be information that tells you things about them to kind of target people, show them ads, et cetera. And a giant business market model is founded on this. And, you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm going back through this history to say, like, there's nothing inevitable or natural about, you know, these technologies, right? they were never democratic, right? They were tools of empire. They were sort of sold based on these, you know, different mythologies that were, you know, extremely profitable for a few, but they never, you know, this idea, this sort of, you know, this Stuart Brand whole earth catalog kind of, you know, the, the ideas that uh, Fred Turner writes a lot in his sort of, you know, history of the counterculture and Silicon Valley work, you know, that this is, you know, these were somehow, initially intended for good and then hijacked for bad, you know, or, you know, hijacked for power when they were, you know, 
you know, inherently kind of decentralizing. None of that is true. All of these technologies may have had sort of, you know, dis- decentralized modalities, but they were all meant to aid in the, you know, the, um, the pursuit of empire by a very, very centralized power structure, that be the, the U.S. military. So I think, you know, when we look at it now, I don't think we should be surprised that these technologies are, you know, are serving to centralize power. I mean, I think, you know, that they are serving to control workers um, and that you now see these sort of ad tech giants, the sort of winners of the, um, the push to commercialize these technologies, um, the, you know, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, et cetera, you know, kind of extending their reach into more and more disparate domains, you know, whether it be healthcare or education or, you know, other core social institutions based on the claim that, you know, the data they have, the computational power that they have, the infrastructure they have, you know, can enable them to, um, you know, know more about these domains than we might know ourselves. And I think we need, you know, again, we need to, you know, kind of scratch the surface of a lot of these premises that, you know, it is that, that around what this technology does and a lot of these narratives um, to understand, um, I don't know, understand why they take the form they do and understand constitutively who they serve. And I think, you know, it's absolutely right that, you know, the platforms that exist, you know, the, the Facebooks, you know, using Gmail, using these different, you know, services are, are certainly used by organizers because, you know, you need to dig where you stand and you don't get a choice in terms of the tools that are available to you. At the same time, you know, these are the same platforms that are controlled and surveilled and, you know, sometimes shut down um, or shaped by these companies and by the needs of these companies. And I think, you know, we were very conscious when we were organizing at Google that, you know, we could not touch any of that infrastructure while we were organizing, right? And then there's a question of, well, what exists? And there really aren't options. It's too expensive. It is too cumbersome. It's too difficult to maintain for all host of reasons we can get into somewhere else to sort of DIY scaled technological infrastructure that works in the capacity we expect it to work in a way that would be um, that would be feasible for a sort of contender to these companies. So I want to, you know, again, I want to take that very seriously and recognize that we are sort of borrowing these or sort of subverting them, but they were never designed to serve us. So I'll stop there. Sorry, I, I, I lost time a little bit looking at my own face. <laughs> oh, that's great. I mean, people people are here to hear the panel. Right? <laughs> they ain't here for me. So, I mean, that was I was furiously taking notes the whole time. I mean, and and I, I know we don't we don't have um, Vina for much longer. So I'll, I'll try to be brief and shut up and kind of go around the table one more time before Mickey hops in for the for the Q&A. But what you were saying there, Meredith, about like where these technologies come from, how they were designed, like that history does really matter. And now my brain's moving like a million miles a second because I was trying to kind of think back to like, you know, even with, even with like analog technologies, right? Like it's not like the technology itself is inherently democratic or lends itself to kind of an inherently democratic action. I was thinking about like the the early days before you know the the kind of radio stations really centralized uh, broadband for kind of certain bigger radio stations. But in the days of maybe a century ago, with uh, these sort of like you know easy radios that you could make uh, that could that could kind of like transmit across you know the plains like in your area and stuff like that, there were ways that people in their own homes or in their own garages could kind of craft technologies and and deploy them for certain ends right that that maybe weren't for profit right or control or surveillance right maybe they just wanted to talk to more people maybe they wanted to hear what was going on beyond their own immediate sphere right there's something democratic in that but it depends on how you build it and what you use it for and that really made me think Because I guess the example that I was going to give for this question is like the right to repair movement, um, where I guess for viewers uh, who don't know, you can check that out. But I mean, it's really uh, a movement that is pushing against kind of like this creeping reality 
that none of us really have a hand in shaping the technologies that we use every day. We can't, we don't build our own radios like that. We don't build our own smartphones, our computers. Like Meredith said, even in organizers in Google, you can't just build that infrastructure from the ground up. Um, and in many, and this translates to the daily realities of, you know, people around the world. Farmers are using John Deere tractors that they can no longer fix because John Deere keeps updating their models so that there are little chips in there. There's code, there's programs that you cannot fix yourself. And I've actually had farmers tell me, it's like, I'm still using my tractor from 30 years ago because if it breaks, I can fix it. If the one, the new one I have breaks, I got to get someone out here to put it on an 18 wheeler, to take it to the nearest dealership, to have them be the ones who fix it. So in a sense, you're taking away my democratic right to fix my own like tools. Right. And so I guess I wanted to kind of uh, go back around and ask that s tying it to what Vina was saying earlier about the question of capitalism. Right. I guess what how can, how can we frame all of this in terms of capitalism, right? Like how can capitalism as a global system help viewers understand kind of what all three of you were saying, right? Like why these technologies are made the way they are, where the power to control them really lies and where our illusions of power and, and empowerment are coming from. So why don't we let's let's talk about capitalism for for the last ten minutes before the Q and A. I guess Venus, since you have to go soon, we can go uh, counterclockwise again. Sure. I mean, I think I could say so many things. Um, a, a few days ago on on that health space Twitter, I um, I saw a um, a VC tweet, a particularly obnoxious VC tweet that he. Uh, you know, he doesn't, he, before he wants his child to be a, a venture capitalist, he wants, he wanted his child to be a maker. And, um, and it, it got me thinking about how there's this real fetishization, um, again, I think rooted in sort of, uh, sort of has some, some interesting historical um, masculine, masculinist um, ideals, but this idea that, um, that somehow the future is the perfection of the present and the way that it becomes perfect is that we make things. Um, and sort of what that misses is who is making those things, who is extracting the surplus of, of, um, of, from the labor of people who make these things, who is funding the making, who is using the things that are made. Um, and I think that when you, when we have, this is like so oversimplified, but it, when I, when I, when I think of sort of the techno, um, techno dystopian world that we live in, and it truly, truly is so much more dystopian than I think any one of us could have imagined even two decades ago, um, or at least that I could have imagined two decades ago, um, what, what is most relevant for me is not necessarily who has the right to speak on Twitter or who is deplatformed. Um, I'm, I guess I'm more interested in, well, who is who is extracting value from this platform and who is losing um, losing that value in the process, who is, whose labor is being exploited in the process, whose lives are being made um, worse in the process. So, you know, going, going to, again, work that I'm most familiar with, um, you know, thinking about um, the service economy, what, what the introduction of digital specific, you know, there's been all kinds of technologies that, that we've, that we've seen in, in, in the service economy. Um, all of these technologies over the past century have been used to um to uh make uh, create anti-union work environments to make workers work longer and faster and harder and the creation and introduction of digital technologies has just um ha is sort of just another iteration of that for the service economy um and so we might see the um or some might see sort of the global proliferation of ride hailing or of um of of these you know grocery shopping or of um of the fact that we can get books or or, or toilet paper in our hands in two days with a click of a button see this as as consumer progress as technological um progress as societal prog progress i think it's more useful to see it through the lens of um of the 
industrial processes, the labor processes involved in getting there, who's directing those processes, where their money is coming from, um, who, who is getting rich off these processes, all of the things that Robin and, um, and, and Meredith ha have been talking about. And if you really sort of disentangle the making um, and really see like who is doing the making versus who is doing, um, who is doing the, um, the hoarding, I think it's clear or it should be clear to, to, to this particular venture capitalist that actually probably doesn't want his son to be an Uber driver because the Uber driver is actually the maker in this context. And that's become invisible in, um, in, in the process of, um, of, you know, techno utopian ideology that we live amongst. So that's my, yeah, my yeah. less than eloquent answer to your question about the intersections of technology and democracy. No. Oh. Uh, point, point, point to Meredith. <laughs> He's doing the heart. Um, Robin, what, what about you? I guess, like, uh, how does capitalism perhaps uh, help us better frame, you know, our understanding of the rule, the terrain we're playing on and the rules we're playing by? Well, you know, Max, when you when, when you introduced the topic, you talked about the this utopian vision that it, it didn't matter what was happening really in legacy media because the internet was going to be the biggest democratization that we, that we all would, would experience. And, you know, I'm, I'm struck by um, Edward Snowden's um, remarks that he made in the movie Citizen Four. And he articulated this vision of the internet, you know, when, when asked by Laura Poitras, why did you do this? You risked your whole life. You you changed your life. You 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 let you you blew all this stuff. You dumped this enormous amount of data on government surveillance and the use of of digital technologies for that. And he said, "I really thought that the internet was an amazing thing when it first came out, and you had teenagers talking to each other across the globe, sharing their life experiences, very different, and you had this kind of kind of utopian communication going on. And he said, little by little, and then he, when he was in the belly of that tech beast, he saw what was really happening. Subsequent to him doing that and trying to alert the world that this was happening, of course, we have the complete uh, oppression and, uh, and criminalization of whistleblowers. And those are political decisions. And those are political decisions made at a governmental level to control information. Just the same thing that's happening to Julian Assange, who has, you know, who released one of the most important mini videos called Collateral Murder um, of, of, of those innocent uh, and, and Samaritans being bombed in Baghdad. And and, and, and look at what has happened. And he's a journalist and they have got both of these people prosecuted under trees in which there really is no defense. You can't, you can't, the, the, there's no defense of those. You, you simply have, have a defense. So we have moved in the information world further and further with big tech and uh, toward a, uh, very anti-democratic practices. And in this sense, I think you can tie it to what Meredith was talking about too, about this stuff is based in the military and our ideas about security and, uh, and, and open information are always constrained by our definition of um, foreign policy and national security. And there's no way around it, but America is now a warring state. Um, we just had a, 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 a global poll and the vast majority of citizens on the globe view the United States as the most dangerous country on earth and the one most likely to, uh, to carry out wars against them. And that's a real big issue and we should be tying these kinds of um, constraints uh, with, of information to these larger issues of, of governance and really questioning, um, is America, can America ever be a good citizen? Can we rein in 
the military uh, and the and the the totalitarian forces that that type of militarism demands, and and can we move toward democracy? Because we we got a little bit of hope. Biden's agenda is so much more progressive than than the four years we experienced. And I think he's actually surprised us all. But look at the foreign policy and look at the military in the middle of a pandemic where we should be we should be doing everything we can to spread resources around the globe in the name of global peace and security. And instead, we 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 still pour money into the military. Uh, and those are the ways that I begin to think about it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I really, really uh, appreciate kind of the the international focus and the imperialist focus, right? Because I mean, though you can't you can't disentangle those from the question of capitalism either, right? Whether we're talking about the kind of capitalist drive of the military industrial complex to build itself up and never have an endpoint, or kind of launching endless imperialist wars for the purposes of um, arranging societies around the globe to better serve the interests of capital. Um, Meredith, what about you? Where does the question, I guess, of capitalism kind of perhaps better help us reframe this whole discussion? I think it's, I think it's central um, and has been sort of a central analytic and all of the answers I've given thus far. And I think, of course, you can't, you know, you can't really... I think it's arguable that capitalism as a world system kind of born out of plantation slavery um, can't exist without empire. And I think we, you know, I think that's something we need to consider when we look at, again, the sort of um, the, the entanglement of a lot of these systems with a lot of, um, of the kind of U.S. military agenda in the, in the frame that I was discussing. Um, I think you know, I think it's also, you know, I, I guess when I think of this question and, and Robin raised this kind of, can we do better? You know, could we do better? Is there a Biden agenda that will, you know, give us a, a better, more democratic, more free, potentially less capitalistic future? And I think, you know, again, I want to want to kind of turn the dial on that and ask who the we is in that context, because, of course, there are, you know, there are winners to this current system and they are the folks who are in control right they they are the executives whose you know fortunes went up untold billions of dollars you know so much that i can never quite keep it in my head even though it's a round number right it just kind of you know it, it exceeds my ability to conceptualize um you know the people who who got rich during the pandemic the people who have learned how to um you know, use these technologies or use their, you know, the, the means by which these technologies enable extraction and control and surveillance um, to extract more capital. So I don't, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be a future in which we all realize that this was just a bad mistake. Inequality, racism, you know, misogyny, et cetera, was all just, you know, like, oops, we were, we were doing it wrong and now we know the right way and we're going to do it right. I think this is, you know, this is going to be a struggle and it's going to be a struggle, you know, as we look at the kind of exponential uptick in climate crisis beginning. So it's, um, I don't, you know, I don't have any, anything really, really optimistic to say at this point, but again, I do want to point, you know, if we're, if we're going to get back to kind of the, the material structural forces behind this technology, I want to look at one thing that I was, I was deeply concerned about and that was sort of catalytic to, you know, my, my beginning to commit myself to organizing at Google, which is the, you know, the growing entanglement between these large tech companies and the U.S. military. And of course, there is a, you know, I, I outlined very schematically historic, you know, genesis of these, you know, network technologies through military funding and military fantasies. Um, however, I think, you know, we're talking about something that is different in form in that these companies now possess extraordinarily intimate, you know, data about us, or at least imagined about us, about billions of people, right? They have, you know, they are entwined into our core infrastructures, into our core social institutions. 
And we are now seeing, you know, the increasing entanglement between these companies and military interests. We have, you know, Eric Schmidt, um, of course, chairs the board of Google, former CEO, um, um, Eric Horvitz, who heads Microsoft AI, Andy Jassy, who is sort of slated to be the next Amazon CEO, chairing the National Security Council on AI. And this is, you know, this is a stunning conflict of interest, but it is also writing the agenda for how AI will be understood and will be procured as a quote unquote national security advantage by the U.S. military. Now, this process that is ongoing, which is effectively letting the titans of the tech industry write a stimulus package for themselves, because no one but the tech industry has the resources and infrastructure to build these technologies. That's a really important point. You cannot bootstrap these technologies. There's a combination of resources and infrastructure that can't just be bought or created. So the military and the government are dependent on them for any of this, right? Um, so you're you're watching these sort of titans write this, you know, effectively a stimulus package and the justification for this stimulus package for why big tech is so crucial to the U.S. national security interest is a growing, quote unquote, AI arms race with China. So you're watching a, you know, I think a very troubling, extremely broad and unnuanced discourse emerge in which China becomes the bad guy. And in order to protect U.S. national interests, we need to, at all costs, elevate, quote unquote, democratic technology that comes from these companies. And I think, um, again, I don't think we're going to be able to fight any of this without contending with that interest convergence of extraordinarily powerful actors in the Western context. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, you know, I guess just even for, for people viewing, right, it's not... It's not that we're being uh, just negative and, and pessimistic in a, in a lot of ways. It's necessary if, if we are going to fight for whatever democracy can mean in the 21st century, we first have to shake loose any lingering, um, you know, illusions about kind of like how much democracy exists in our kind of current moment in the kind of digital world or how democratic we are able to live uh, and act with our digital technologies. Like in a sense, we, we almost have to kind of get past uh, all of that sort of uh, ideological conditioning and branding from the world of big tech and beyond to really kind of know the score and to really know what we're up against and where the battle lines are, are really drawn. Um, so, I, I, I really could talk to, to y'all for, for days, but I know that we've got um, kind of Mickey, who's been um, checking the live chat, sourcing questions from um, folks who are watching right now on YouTube. So I wanted to, to turn things over to him while we still have Meredith and Robin. And, and shout out to Vina. Thank you so much for joining us, Vina. We love you. And, and uh, yeah, folks, like I said, definitely go check out Vina's work as well as Meredith's and, and Robin's. So um, with that, Mickey, I pass it over to you. What's going on in the, in the YouTube chat? Well, thanks so much, Max. I've got a couple questions and I've got a few riffs to follow through uh, on. That was uh, an incredible panel, an incredible conversation. So many interrelated ideas happening that we really need to be um, just talking about very openly and um, a big problem with corporate media is you, you'll never hear a dialogue like this. You, you won't hear um, what any of our panelists uh, is really talking about in any of the corporate media. And by that, I'm including, of course, um, even NPR and PBS. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, I'm Mickey Huff, Director of Project Censored. I'm uh, co-hosting Questions and Moderators here with Max Alvarez at The Real News Network. This is part of a three-part series. Today, we're looking at Can Democracy Exist in the Digital Era? Our panelists, uh, Vina Dubal, had to uh, leave um, early, but she's Professor of Law at University of California, Hastings. Meredith Whitaker is Research Professor at New York University, co-founder of the AI Now Institute. And Robin Anderson is joining us, Professor of Communications Media Studies at Fordham University. So um, I'm going to pull out, extract a couple of the questions that I have. There's a couple, uh, I think, that are really relevant here. But I was especially struck um, after listening to all of the things coming together from everything from the gig economy 
um, you know, to the to the to the questions of technology is the ever dual edged sword, um, right? In terms of how it you how it's used, how how it uses us, who uses it, who makes it, um, and then of course again the ever revolving doors between the public and private sector that somehow are just off screen, off camera, behind the curtain at the Wizard of Oz that we're never supposed to to ask the questions, right? about that. And I wanted to bring this question first and foremost, and then we can go and get to some of the rest. I couldn't help but think about can democracy exist in the digital era, despite all of our, um, what do we mean by these questions? And what are the exact definitions? And let's, let's nail some of those down so that we can have a conversation about them in varied contexts. But can democracy exist in the digital era? Well, we are reminded by the very technological titans like people at companies like New Knowledge that worked with the Senate uh, Intelligence Committee that changed their name to Yonder, right? We're talking about Jonathan Morgan. We're talking about Rene DeResta. DeResta called for an information war, quite literally. And Nolan Higdon and I wrote about this in the United States of Distraction, um, working with the Senate Intelligence Committee in the fall of 2018. Um, she wrote about something that she called the digital Magino line, right? So anybody that knows World War II history will know what that refers to. But she says there is a war happening and we are immersed in an evolving, ongoing conflict. An information world war is how she called it. Um, she went so far as to say the human mind is the territory. And if you aren't a combatant, you are the territory, Right. And somehow in the midst of all of these high tech struggles between great uh, global powers, um, let's not forget that uh, New Knowledge was one of the three major companies that was contracted by the U.S. government to find connections between Russia and the 2016 election outcome. So, yes, I am resurrecting uh, the ghost of Russiagate here. Um, it hasn't really gone away. It may have. Uh, disappeared for some of us who have looked on to other things. But remember, if you're a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so these people are basically hired to find connections, whether or not they're there. And the ring, reason I bring up new knowledge and the fact that they changed their name to Yonder, when the tough gets going, um, you know, I guess names are changed, people move on. Um, so this is a company whose CEO, Jonathan Morgan, was caught and the New York Times even called this a false flag operation. They meddled in the Alabama special Senate election to make it look like the Republican Roy Moore was getting support from the Kremlin. And once caught doing that, and he did it to see if they, how, how successful they could be, his great punishment was being suspended from social media for a short period of time. So we're talking about, and look, new knowledge is Lux Capital, GGV Capital. Um, you know, emergent technologies. These are companies that work to create Hamilton 68 database, the U.S. German Marshall Fund. So I'm riffing now on what Meredith is talking about. So I want to start with Meredith um, about this issue. Um, so what can we say? How can democracy in any generic sense, even that we, you know, we do-gooders and um, well-intentioned folk that, that want to believe in these kind of systems, how do we compete with these invisible forces that are not just manipulating um, electoral outcomes, but to go back to Eddie Bernays nearly 100 years ago, they're literally pulling the wires of the public mind algorithmically or in other ways. Meredith Whitaker. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I haven't researched this case, so I, I can't comment specifically. What I can say is I don't, you know, I don't think it's that invisible. I think we can look at the voter disenfranchisement that has been, uh, you know, above the surface and, you know, deeply racist. It has been targeted at preventing black people from voting. I think we can look at, you know, the, the agenda of the Kochs and the Mercers and a lot of the very far right backers that are clearly very well organized and, you know, have taken a lot of less lessons from the, you know, radical left in the 60s and 70s and, you know, kind of turn them on us. So I don't, you know, while I certainly recognize the evidence that there are, you know, a number of actors that are instrumenting kind of micro targeting capabilities and, you know, studying the way information is disseminated via, you know, algorithmically driven ad tech engagement systems. I think we also you know, 
need to look at the, the bigger picture. I don't think we are being kind of infiltrated by, you know, subtle vaporous kind of um, um, forces that are kind of giving us brain worms and polluting our ideology so much as there are, you know, there is a, an entire ad tech ecology that has been sort of, you know, used to try to disseminate messages. We have a collapsing, collapsing media ecology more or less because, you know, it was, it was uh, cannibalized is not the w right word, but I guess, you know, decimated by Facebook and other media platforms. Um, and we have a very well organized far right that has a lot of the, you know, the kind of oligarch class on their side, very well funded, um, who have been, you know, chipping away at, um, you know, at workers' rights, at, you know, voter enfranchisement, at, you know, the laws that protect racial equ equity that have been working with, you know, the Federalist Society and others to, you know, shift the judiciary, right, to set case law. So I don't, you know, I, I think it's a lot of it is very much above the surface. And we can, you know, again, I, I want to reference Citizens United and the, you know, now unchecked ability for corporations to, you know, and, and wealthy individuals to secretly donate as much money as they can to, you know, political campaigns, um, you know, which has, you know, I think completely, uh, that's my doorbell, but um, completely uh, polluted our, our, you know, electoral process, um, uh, irrespective. Sorry, I'm, I'm now distracted by the, by the door, but um, I, I hope that gives you a, a, a bit of a sense of where I come, um, come down on that. That topic. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I agree that it is visible for people that are looking. I think my broader point is for folks that maybe are less critically media literate. Um, I, I think that maybe maybe sometimes we're not always asking the right questions per se. Um, and uh, you know, Edward Snowden's name came up here. Um, also, sort of the history of the military industrial complex. So I wanted to riff on a couple of those themes to you, Robin, um, and then get to these uh, get to the couple questions that we have from our folks from YouTube. Um, going back to the 1950s, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, US lab that works with the Pentagon, CIA, NSA, these other agencies, um, you know, they've been the technological source of innovation behind everything from the internet to drones, self-driving cars, mass surveillance tools, GPS, et cetera, all designed for military purposes with public money, purportedly for public good, purportedly later um, for, Consum consumer use or to better consumers' lives, uh, so to speak. Um, but this, can, this is getting back to that blurred line between the public and private sector. And one of the comments that comes through YouTube actually kicked the whole thing off about, you know, well, I don't want to get rid of YouTube or I don't want to get rid of this internet stuff, you know, because it's a, it's a useful tool. And sure, maybe there's things about it that aren't great, but um, um, I don't want to get rid of it entirely. Okay, well, I don't think we're saying that we're going to get rid of anything. And I don't think we're calling for an abolition of this kind of technology. Um, I think we're being mindful of who's controlling it to what ends. And I believe most of us here, everybody here is against censorship. So um, back to Ed Snowden and thinking about that issue of, of censorship. Um, S Snowden once remarked um, that Facebook's data policies are exploitative and resemble the work of a surveillance company and that they were just as untrustworthy as the NSA. He once said, businesses that make money by collecting and selling detailed records of private lives were once plainly described as surveillance companies. Their rebranding as social media is the most successful deception since the Department of War became the Department of Defense. Um, he reminds us that Facebook's internal purpose, whether they state it publicly or not, is to compile perfect records of private lives to maximum extent of their cap capability and to exploit that for their own corporate enrichment. Damn the consequences. And this is actually precisely the same as what the NSA does. Google has a very similar model. So now, again, we're blurring lines here, right? Um, these are companies now that have all of this data, all of this information, and now they're also deciding unilaterally who gets to be on their platform, what they get to say. Robin Anderson, where do you see this intersection and this blurred lines? And what do you say about, um, you know, the current cancel culture and deplatforming that's taking place? And how this impacts to our theme about democracy existing in a digital era? Well, right. I mean, we're really right to be pointing out that these technologies were developed with the help of uh, 
within DARPA and the other um, military research facilities that you forgot one with the military industrial entertainment complex, Mickey, and that is video games and the actual ways in which weapon systems are actually deployed and used. So we, we put all of the money in the military and the military develops the high tech and then we give a little bit of it to entertainment to a civilian society who learns to accept and adopt it. Our audiovisual milieu becomes very dominated by these um, the same images that we see bombing people that are also on the video games. We, we learn to ad adopt things that have been, been for, technologies have been developed for nefarious purposes to then incorporate them into our daily lives and make our, uh, make us happier because we can use them to buy consumer products. So you've got, you've got this cons capital consumerism all wrapped up in a military project and they, they actually are uh, at this point inseparable. The problem of course with, with Facebook initially uh, is, is that it has, it monetized the technology and built within it. It's a, it's the platform to, push the people to click the button and push the button and those people who push the button on the most outrageous stories that was tied to advertising and they went all over the web this is a commercial problem um and it's about conglomeration and and it's about um uh no no competition and no 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 other game in town so it seems that unraveling these things now seems like an impossible task. And that's what brings us to, how do we get out of the militarism? How do we get out of, of capitalism? And, um, you know, we can talk about it and when we can theorize it and come up with stuff, but we're kind of in a real fix. Um, we accept it because, okay, we can use these digital technologies to organize and to get information and we use them too. Um, but at what cost to the larger picture um, of how they were developed, how they are tied, we, we can never get to a place where there are, they are our technology and we can do that uh, in a free an environment characterized by freedom and community um, and equality and anti-racism and anti-sexism and all that stuff. It's inherent within the, the technologies at this point. And we we're kind of picking up the droppings from the table. Well, Robin, speaking of uh, the riffs on critical theory, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say happy birthday to Karl Marx, uh, 1818 birthday, birthday, May 5th. Here we are, May 5th. So, and uh, I think Max is grabbing his, yep, he's got the marking the reader. So we've all, we've all done our, 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 our good duty today for, uh, <laughs> for all of, all of the red baiters out there. Um, so I want to get to this question. There's a couple questions that had come through YouTube and I'm sort of synthesizing them here. I, the ironies of YouTube as one of our platforms. Um, can we really use these platforms? Um, these are corporate platforms, despite the fact that they all have come from, you know, public monies, public sector interests, et cetera. Can we use them to further democracy? Should we stop using them? What are your thoughts on this? Um, more specifically, what are the opportunities or constraints then of using these online tools to, to say, organize in-person activism? Um, and what kinds of digital media do we need to, what kind of digital media or platforms would we need to be able to organize uh, for this kind of progressive change? Uh, Meredith, we go to you. I think my first, my first response to this question is that this is not this is not an issue that can be understood or solved through a framework of individual choice or consumer action. Um, and I don't think we have really a choice. We cannot use YouTube, but then, you know, where are we going to watch the lecture video we're assigned in class or what have you? We cannot use Facebook, but too bad our friends uploaded photos that included us and Facebook has a ghost profile, right? We cannot use Amazon except 
you know, let's say Amazon instrumented the town where we live into some smart city and has data on us. So these are not, you know, again, this is not an individual choice framework and we dig where we stand. We use what we have and we try to make the best of it. I think, you know, we can use these technologies to broadcast organizing messages, to try to get information out there. They're limited, they're faulty, they are, you know, controlled by kind of opaque authoritarian policies that often target, you know, sex workers and, um, you know, radicals first in a lot of cases. Um, but we, you know, we use what we can and we, we try to get by. I think if we're talking about, you know, doing kind of organizing strategy, um, through kind of digital means, I say, you know, always use signal. Um, that's what I trust. Uh, I'm on their board and, you know, they don't collect any data. And when I was, when I was organizing at Google, which has a digital threat model that is obviously very high, Google has, you know, some of the best, um, security engineers on the planet and owns a lot of that infrastructure. Um, you know, I, we, we always use signal for our strategic communications and, um, I have reason to believe that, you know, those were, were never obtained or by, by Google and, and we were able to kind of get much farther. So that's a, that is sort of, you know, from the abstract to the practical. But again, I think, you know, I really want to push back on any framing that would, you know, make this an issue of individual choice. Um, that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at issues of power and in issues of who controls the infrastructure that we are conscripted to use. That's Meredith Whit Whitaker, professor, research professor, New York University, co-founder of AI Now Institute. Robin Anderson, same to you. No, I agree with Meredith. I mean, um, these are these were never issues of personal choice. It, it, it absolutely has to do with um, how, how communities and, and social forces and people who are organizing um, choose to use these. Of, co of course we have to use YouTube. And as for the conference that, that you mentioned last week um, about digital media and the, uh, and the Americas, we, we take that chance. It gets taken deplatformed and we don't know where it went. Um, but at some level, it gives us a catalyst to talk about these things and to, to contemplate um, how we're gonna use them and what we're going to be doing about it in the future. And I think that really it's, it's an open discussion and, uh, and we need to keep talking about it. I mean, I think there are ways to repair this technology if there was a political will, if we had leaders and, tech and technicians to actually do it. I think there's a bit of a wrongheadedness in some of the discussion um, but that's part of the that's part of our dialogue. Democracy is messy. Um, I I really enjoy not having Donald Trump on social media. Um, however, deplatforming is not the solution. We need to find better solutions, uh, and we need to do it together. Robin Anderson, professor of communication media studies, Fordham University. I'm sorry, Meredith, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just, I want to respond to that because I think it's really important. I think um, it's very difficult to theorize these ideas like deplatforming or censorship. But I want to really call attention to the danger that people like Donald Trump and the far right who are very, very well organized in these spaces pose to people who oppose them. And these are often black women, people of color and others who will have hordes of followers sent after them, you know, at the flick of a tweet. And yeah. I think we also need to look at the deplatforming that happens there when powerful figures on the right are able to coordinate these attacks that, you know, have resulted in physical harm and people, you know, being swatted and doxxed and threatened and having to move houses, et cetera, um, after this type of online threat. So I think we just have to complicate that notion that, um, that the only direction of censorship or deplatforming happens, you know, in terms of Facebook choosing to remove Donald Trump. I think Donald Trump and the organized right online has been responsible for, you know, quote unquote, deplatforming and censoring many, many, many millions more voices um, than a single Donald Trump through those methods of intimidation, 
of targeted harassment, of threats, and even of physical violence. Yeah. And I would just add to that, that um, that kind of trolling and deplatforming and harassment of uh, people of color and women online is one of the ways in which in 2016, Donald Trump became president. He, yeah. he used those kinds of messages and retweeting and coding of the far right with all of that uh, Breitbart that, that, that is founded in Breitbart. He used that and he released this horror that had been, um, well, smoldering for, for many years. And he, he brought it to the fore and in, in, in a way, now we know it's out in the open, but the damage that he's done in, um, in feeding those, that, that flame has been really bad, almost yeah. immeasurable. Well, Robin Anderson, Meredith Whitaker, and also Vina Duval, who was here with us earlier, we are at the uh, end of our 90-minute program, I'm afraid. Uh, I, we could stay here and, and talk about this and discuss it, um, as Max said earlier, uh, for hours. And uh, it's been an honor to be part of the panel and to uh, listen to all of the things that you all had to say. Um, uh, this is going to be archived and available at the Real News Network, so people can use it for classroom use. Uh, it's a great conversation piece, great stuff to have in classes. And with that, um, I want to hand things back over to you, Max Alvarez. And we have one more uh, in the series next week with Professor Nolan Higdon, Abby Martin of the Empire Files. You and I will be here. But um, with that, I hand things over to you, Max. Thanks so much, Mickey. And uh, yeah, once again, thank you to Project Censored for partnering with us uh, on this important live stream series. Um, thank you to our incredible panelists for all three of these live streams. Meredith, Vina, Robin, um, cannot thank you enough for sharing all your uh, brilliance and insight so generously um, with us and with our audience um, and just with the work that you do on a day to day basis. I mean, you know, we're talking here about democracy, right? There are little courageous democratic acts that all of us do still do on a day to day basis and sharing what we have with one another, um, I think, is is one way of doing that. Um, and so I just really wanted to kind of, yeah, end by thanking our panel, thanking Project Censored, thanking our amazing audience for tuning in and sharing your questions. Thank you to uh, Dwayne Gladden, who's behind our Oz behind the scenes, who's been running this live stream. Uh, Kayla Rivara, who's been behind the scenes with me and Nolan Higdon and Mickey planning this whole series. And, you know, I guess just to kind of maybe bring things full circle with a closing thought, you know, um, Meredith, Vina, and Robin all rightly kind of complicated the, the question of this panel. And I hope that, you know, as we depart from this panel, all of us who are watching and all of us who are participating, it's worth reflecting on the fact that we can't really answer this question until we critically reckon with the fact we can't answer the question of can democracy exist in the, di the digital era until we reckon with the fact that, I mean, at least here in the U.S., I'll stay, I'll stay in the U.S., our definition of democracy sucks, right? I mean, we have a very, very bad kind of way of understanding democracy. I love um, Astra Taylor's way of putting it. She has one of the best book titles of all time uh, called Democracy Doesn't Exist, But We'll Miss It When It's Gone, right? And I think that you know, in a lot of ways, there is a sort of democratic uh, impulse within us that we know and recognize um, when we are being wronged, when our democratic rights are being taken away. But in so many ways, we have also grown up in a world that has trained us not to see all the realms of our lives where democracy should be present, where we should be demanding more democracy, whether that is the workplace or whether that is, you know, just kind of in our ability to live right and 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 shape the environments that we live in like meredith said uh so much of our understanding of democracy is is just like limited and circumscribed within the definition of individual 
parentheses consumer choice, right? But there's so much more to democracy than that. There's so much more to freedom than that. And, and the ability to have kind of democratic accountability for the powers that be. Um, and I think that, yeah, hopefully more than anything, folks leave this live stream critically evaluating how the the perhaps the digital era has given us you know a mutant form of democracy that is based on our very limited understanding of it in this country right and in fact we should be fighting for a more expansive version that goes beyond you know the realm of individual choice but that includes things like the ability to live with dignity the ability to uh as robin said earlier you know have access uh free access to the necessities of living whether that be water or a livable planet Right. Those are kind of ways of evaluating uh, democracy that um, in many ways we haven't had a vocabulary for. And I think it's it's incumbent upon all of us to build it. Um, and so with that, again, I just wanted to thank our incredible panel and ask everyone watching to please tune in next Wednesday when we conclude this three part live stream series um, with our, our final kind of panel in the series, The Long Silicon, Power and Censorship in the Digital Era. This is Maximilian Alvarez for The Real News Network, signing off. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week.